Hello and welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Today's retro review is 1994's The Resurrected Volume 2 of Keys and Gates, for Call of Cthulhu 5th Edition by Pagan Publishing. Ok, first a bit of history. Of Keys and Gates is a 32-page softback collection of three short scenarios. The first appeared in the Unspeakable Oath magazine that deal with one of the key themes of Lovecraft, the idea that evil is contained but forever straining against its bonds, and that the bonds will ultimately fail. As the cover is really nothing to write home about, we'll go straight to the inside. First up is a foreword by John Tynes explaining the reason for the collection, where he goes into a little detail as to what it brings to the table. We also have a small dedication to the early readers of The Unspeakable Oath, which is a nice touch, and then we go straight into the first scenario, The Travesty. There will be spoilers from this point on, so stop reading now if you intend to play this. The Travesty is a non-mythos scenario that takes place in the Goodrest Inn in Wisconsin near Lake Superior. The inn sits atop a lonely hill and involves the manager, Robert Tollison, who has, for whatever reason the keeper decides, called the adventurers to come and investigate strange happenings that have been taking place there. The scenario is designed to keep the investigators isolated. The basic premise of the adventure is around a creature originally summoned in the early 1800s by a shaman of the Menomini tribe to keep white settlers away known as a juggler. After it slew the families of three settlers and terrified those Native Americans that had seen it, the shaman relented and trapped it inside a lonely nearby hill. Over the passage of time, the juggler has been misidentified as a jester, hence the reason it has a jester's cap on in the accompanying picture, and we're described by witnesses that saw it as a travesty of a human being. With the passage of time, a Garrett Moss and his family purchased the land that the hill sat on, ignoring the whispered talk of the hill being cursed. With a number of illnesses and strange events occurring, Moss made contact with the entity through his dreams, in which the jester promised him power in exchange for freedom, and on one drunken night, Moss agreed. The freed jester slew his family in front of him, but Moss was tougher and more prepared than the jester expected, and he drove her back into the land, shoring up the wards. Moss knew the wards wouldn't hold, and after remarrying, he passed the knowledge of the jester on to his son. Eventually, the inn was bought by Robert Tollison, and the creature started slipping its bonds and is becoming free again. The travesty is described as a very cunning creature that has the ability to warp reality, and it has foul offspring called the Breed, who appear as dismembered body parts melded together in a twisted mockery of life. We have all of the floors of the house detailed, as well as information on the kind of research the investigators can perform given their limited resources. It stats out the guests currently in the house, and details things like their motivation and current mental state. The scenario takes a turn for the worse when the jester starts warping reality, preying on the fears of the players and guests alike, with their main hope of winning lying in the ritual that imprisons the creature in a diary in the basement. The players need to perform the ritual and ultimately win, if ever you can in Call of Cthulhu, by trapping the monster. It's worth mentioning at this point that the author, Chris Klepak, was only 14 years old when he wrote the scenario, and it shows a great deal of maturity. The next adventure is The House on Stratford Lane. This involves the machinations of a Mr. Catonic University student called Charles Edwards and his study of the occult. Through his investigations, Charles has concluded that gateways, or as he says, windows, can be open to other places and planes of existence, and he's currently working on creating one using the research of a physicist called Alvin Masters. Unbeknownst to Charles, that his window will open to the hostile environs of Yugoth. The scenario begins with the investigators being contacted by an associate, Mr. James Burbridge, who wants them to look into the background of Charles. Being a recluse to harder goes outside, his house has deteriorated into this repair, and while that in itself is no crime, his odd character and the recent disappearance of a local girl has made him the prime suspect in her disappearance. The police have no reason to suspect Charles, but Burbridge feels like they are not doing their job properly. The actual kidnapper is a neighbour, Richard Margrave, who has a lock in his basement and is trying his hardest to agitate the neighbourhood in order to frame Charles for the crime, even to the point of planting the young girl, Elizabeth Winfield's dress, in Charles's coal chute. The adventure starts with the kind of investigating that the players should be used to, the local police, the Winfields, etc. And sharp-eyed, or indeed very lucky investigators, should find various bits of information that, while not related to the disappearance of Elizabeth, should intrigue them about what Charles is up to. The players can even track down information on Alvin Masters and his gate machine. The adventure details Charles's house, as well as Margrave's abode, including his huge Doberman called Fluffy, and the scenario culminates in the combination of Elizabeth being found, a fight with Margrave and Charles succeeding in opening a gate to Yugoth, whereupon Migo will start coming into our world, which the investigators will need to deal with. The final scenario is called Within You Without You, and it is designed for four to six players of medium experience. The adventure is divided into three sections. Part 1 deals with one of the investigators receiving a letter from an old mentor, launching them into events. Part 2 deals with the village of Solace, Massachusetts, where they will be confused. And Part 3 deals with a sorcerer's forgotten laboratory. 
The scenario is based around investigating and problem solving with little combat happening until part 3. In fact the biggest obstacles that the investigators face are time, weather and the general strangeness of solace. It begins with the aforementioned letter being received from a Dr Pettigrew, an old friend and colleague that retired from academic circles, who has dug up something of interest concerning the town of Solace. The players have the opportunity to research Solace before heading to meet him. The town of Solace, previously known as Solus, was founded by a Joseph Woodcotting in the 1620s. Woodcotting had broken away from the established Orthodox Church to found his settlement. The settlers were unaware, however, that Woodcotting was a sorcerer and worshipper of Yog sothoth and that the settlement's isolation was an ideal situation for him and his experimentation. In the year of 1680, Woodcotting received a large manuscript from an associate in Salem that took decades of his magically extended life to decipher, and what he found amazed him. He determined that the author had devised a ritual that would allow them to travel through time effortlessly at will. Everything that was could be witnessed and learned from. Over the next 10 years, he planned and prepared, acclimatising the town for the performance of the ritual by creating a yearly festive holiday which people grew used to. The townspeople unknowingly worshipped Yog sothoth singing the incantation of the ephemeral spheres. Unfortunately, as is often the case, his preparations were inadequate, and upon completion, the town vanished in an instant, leaving a barren plain behind. The disappearance was noted by trappers, but as they actively discouraged visitors, it was not missed. Sixty years later, a veteran of the Revolutionary War settled the area and dubbed it Solace. In recent days, Dr. Pettigrew has discovered Woodcotting's laboratory cave, untouched for 200 years, initially not venturing in on his own after hearing strange noises inside. Unfortunately for the investigators, the morning they arrive in Solace, Dr. Pettigrew has entered the cave, and upon finding the curious instrument pictured here, has set the ritual off again. Within a few hours, Solus has begun coming back into the world. The scenario proper begins with the investigators arriving in Solace in the snow, when almost immediately strange things begin happening. They start seeing Solus as it was 200 years ago. They begin witnessing the disembodied inhabitants of Solus possessing the current inhabitants of Solus. They see people possessed by both animals and people alike, man, woman and child. The investigators will have to navigate their way around Solus and may even get possessed themselves, which should present some great role-playing opportunities. They should investigate the various locations here and eventually deduce the location of Dr Pettigrew and make their way to his cottage. Unfortunately, Dr. Pettigrew himself is currently under a possession attack, eventually succumbing to a John Stalin, a devout Solacite who has absolute faith in woodcutting. Investigating Pettigrew's cottage, they find the words of the incantation of the ephemeral spheres, which the residents of Solace will recognise if informed of them. By the next day, the attacks are becoming more frequent, and the residents of Solace start partially taking control of their own minds and bodies, resulting in a horrific fusion of flesh and bone. Eventually, by following the clues and guidance of the residents of Solus, the players should end up finding Woodcotting's workshop in the cave. Upon discovering the cave, accompanied by Dr. Pettigrew, even if left behind, he follows them. They arrive to find a cave entrance at the base of a hill covered in deep snow. If they explore the cave, they find a storage area and a pit which contains a monstrous guardian created by Woodcotting, which they really should avoid. Eventually, they will come upon the laboratory. The instrument of Yog sothoth pictured earlier, is here. The tuning forks hum and the glass spheres whirl, powered by unknown forces. If the players take the time to explore a bit, they will come across Woodcotting's journal, mostly illegible due to the moisture in the cave, but sections of which can be read. If they read the journal, they need to make a decision on how to stop what's happening, and they realistically have three options. Destroy the mechanism, halt it, or even tune it to the proper tone. It's at this point that Woodcotting possesses Dr. Pettigrew, though he will not immediately reveal himself. If they proceed with correctly tuning it, all hell breaks loose. The bodies of Pettigrew, Stalin and Woodcotting all merge as one, though they don't immediately die like everyone else does. First thing the Woodcotting thing proceeds to do is to disappear with the instruments. If the investigators escape the cave and head back to town, the Woodcotting thing is attempting to complete the ritual one last time to finally receive the power it seeks. Anyone left behind in the town is completely under the Woodcotting thing's sway. In the centre of the town, the ritual is in full swing, it is at this point that the investigators' minds can be utterly destroyed by entering the waves of energy coming from the ritual. As it progresses, they see the waves of energy pulling back, stripping everything with them, snow, trees and buildings, folding in on itself. The investigators must make the decision whether to flee or watch. If they leave, they are spared the horrible sanity hit that is to come. If they stay, they begin to realise that something has gone wrong, as woodcutting can be heard screaming for the villagers to stop. At this point, they need to resist a power 18 attack, or they are drawn into the ritual by Yog sothoth if they succeed, they will witness Yog sothoths absorption of Solus and Solus. If they fail, they are momentarily drawn into Yog sothoth and for a split second understand life, the universe and everything, before being drawn back into their body and losing 20% of their san and becoming indefinitely insane, needing to be institutionalised in order to make any sort of recovery. 
If they fumble this roll, they are drawn into yog sothoth itself and lost forever, the body remaining as a mindless vegetable. What was left of the two towns being drawn away is a large area of exposed earth. Of Keys and Gates is a well put together collection of scenarios that will challenge players well if run with some thought. The travesty is fairly clever in the way it scares players, but requires a quite complex ritual to defeat the jester that could prove awkward for keepers to keep track of, and it was my thought that the body horror of the breed was probably scarier than the main antagonist itself. The house in Stratford Lane is good, although I thought that the final summoning of the Migo through the window may be a step too far after the players have been worn down with the uncovering of the true kidnapper, as more often than not, the mere thought of a missing child is more difficult to bear than any amount of evil alien intelligences. Of the three scenarios contained here, this is perhaps what I would call the most conventional adventure. I felt the final scenario, Within You Without You, was the most daring of the batch. The real challenge here would be the players and keeper representing the possessed solar sites, as well as their own characters, and the climax is a rare case of the players genuinely being unable to win, either fleeing or the possibility of insanity being the only viable options. Art is used incredibly sparingly throughout, but when it's present it's nicely done, and the general feel is good, but I wouldn't purchase this with the expectation that these are in any way campaign worthy. Each scenario should take two to three sessions to completion. Unfortunately, this is not available in PDF format legally, so your only option when buying this is the usual places. I give O'Keys and Gates a respectable 6.5 out of 10. If you enjoyed this review, please hit the thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Also, don't forget to check out my other reviews. But out.